Hello guys and welcome aboard to Flagship Medicine. Today I'm gonna talk about the new SARS-CoV-2 vaccine and patients with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. It's been over a year since the world changed. There is a new villain in town and his name is Coronavirus, also known as SARS-CoV-2, that quarantined the globe and frequently made us feel alone. Even the aliens heard and decided to postpone their plans with us. But years and years of research and passionate people led to 172 vaccines in preclinical trials, 60 in clinical development and 2 approved for commercial use. And there is more good news. As of 28th of December 2020, 3 vaccines are now in phase 3 clinical trial. The vaccines from AstraZeneca, Janssen and Novavax. And yes, I said it right, years and years of research, because the idea of an mRNA vaccine is as old as the 1990s, but this will be the topic of another video. But why focus on patients with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases, for short RMDs? There are 200 RMDs known so far, and one third of the population has some kind of musculoskeletal complaint at least one time in their life, according to Ular. RMDs have a high economic burden and are the first cause of sick leave and early retirement because of the disabilities created. Autoimmune rheumatic diseases counts for 6.7 million Americans and if we extrapolate the data worldwide this means 139 million patients. But what's the impact of COVID-19 in patients with RMDs, especially with autoimmune rheumatic diseases? Although the data we have so far supports the fact that suffering from an RMD does not increase the risk of contracting SARS-CoV-2, on 23rd of December 2020, CDC updated the high-risk list for severe illness caused by the virus, and this list includes patients with immunocompromised state, immune deficiencies, prolonged use of corticosteroids, and we know from previous reports that using more than 10 mg daily of glucocorticoids increases the risk of hospitalization, and use of other immune-weakening therapies. So really, in this case, what can we do? Everything in our lives is a reflection of the decision we make, and frequently this decision lies between being active or passive. We have the preventive measures, wear a mask over the nose and mouth, wash and disinfect your hands often, and of course social distancing, 6 feet or 2 meters, consider meeting outdoors or in well-ventilated spaces, and don't touch the person you are visiting. And now we have the choice of being active and vaccinate. I'm sure we all know how coronavirus affects the body, the infection, post-infection, and side effects from the treatment used, ischemic stroke and thromboembolic events, lung problems, myocarditis, encephalopathy and impaired consciousness, loss of smell and taste, polyneuropathy, myopathies and arthritis, chronic fatigue and many many more. And now let's talk about the vaccines and how do the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna vaccines work. The outer shell of the virus is composed of membrane protein, envelope protein and spike protein. What makes coronavirus the family unique are the spike proteins that give the appearance of a crown. Unfortunately, these are giving the superpower for the virus to attach to our receptors, ACE receptors and internalize in our cells. These spike proteins are recognized as antigens by our immune system and then a whole cascade of immune response begins. In some people, the immune response is so important that it results in a cytokine storm, which is very loudly symptomatic. The whole point of an immune response is to create antibodies that form immune complexes with the antigens and to eliminate these immune complexes. But until the immune response is activated, the virus has enough time to replicate and produce major damage in our bodies. This is what the vaccine does, it trains the immune system to recognize earlier than usual the antigen, in this case the spike protein, so that it can react promptly the next time they meet. What is the antigen for coronavirus? The membrane or the spike proteins? The RNA? Unicorns? Or leave me alone, I don't care. Yes, the right answer is the spike proteins. But instead of replicating and introducing the antigen directly into the body, researchers found another method, 
creating a vaccine that has the genetic code, the messenger RNA, that can produce spike proteins and train our immune system to react quickly when it encounters the real coronavirus, both by creating antibodies and memory T lymphocytes. Under no circumstances can we get infected with the virus because the mRNA contains only the information to produce the spike proteins. After it has done its job, the body gets rid of the genetic information. The spike proteins were studied for years in other coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, and also the mRNA vaccines were researched for influenza, MERS, Zika, rabies, cytomegalovirus, but there wasn't enough interest for them to get approval. And what about the efficiency? Both vaccines that are approved have 94.1% for Moderna and 95% for Pfizer-BioNTech efficacy in preventing laboratory-confirmed COVID-19 illness, according to CDC. As for the side effects, the majority is mild to moderate, especially after the second dose. There is no scientific evidence to support the fake news that these vaccines cause leukemia or infertility. Let's get back to our topic, patients with RMDs. Unfortunately, both of the studies for the development of the vaccine excluded this category of patients. But there are well-known international societies formed by health professionals, researchers and patients with many years of experience in RMDs and also in vaccines. These are ULAR, European League Against Rheumatism, ACR, American College of Rheumatology, BCR, British Society for Rheumatology, and APLAR, Asia Pacific League Against Rheumatism. ULAR and BCR stated that based on the scientific evidence so far, evidence that will be continuously updated, patients with RMDs, including those who are using immunosuppressive therapy, can safely receive the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. ACR will develop recommendation addressing this issue on the first quarter of 2021, and I didn't find APLAR's position on vaccination against SARS-CoV-2 from the resources available online. Additionally, ULAR advises that the vaccine should be given preferably when the rheumatic disease is in a quiet phase and before planned immunosuppression when possible. There is a little exception, the use of rituximab. ULAR suggests that patients receiving rituximab should contact their rheumatologist before vaccination, while BCR recommends that the vaccine should be administered 4 weeks or more before the therapy with rituximab, and where this is possible, the switch from rituximab to other immunosuppressors should be considered, because the vaccine can trigger an incomplete immune response against COVID-19, but this option should be evaluated in a case-by-case -case basis. To conclude, I think rheumatology is wonderful because the choice of the therapy in general is a common decision between the patient and the doctor, as stated by the official guidelines. Chronic rheumatic diseases come with psychological and emotional burden, so the relationship between the patient and their doctor is extremely important. Considering the vaccination against SARS-CoV-2, it is important to know the facts both about the disease, post-disease burden, effects from the treatment used for COVID-19, and about the vaccination. The decision should be personalized according to individual risk, disease activity, what immunosuppressive therapy is used, age, comorbidities, and so on. But the future looks promising. Thank you very much for watching! All the links for the information provided in this video are in the description below. If you like my content, please don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell icon. See you soon!